tomorrow is your uh, final day. Have you enjoyed the yeah. academy? Yeah. <laughs> so you don't want to go home or you want to stay here longer? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> stay one more week. Huh? <laughs> I hope you have some time to uh, go around uh, your solo. I don't know whether you know the meaning of Yosu, but uh, Yosu uh, means uh, uh, beautiful water. Uh, it is a beautiful area. I hope you have a uh, uh, chance to look around uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, town. Um, um, already uh, it's uh, uh, quite late. Uh, But uh, I try to uh, um, finish in one hour um, so that you have some time for lunch. Um, the topic uh, I want to uh, address uh, uh, um, this afternoon is uh, uh, Lopsy Convention, Dispute Settlement System, and International Tribunal for the Law of Civil. Uh, I, I guess uh, you, by this time, you are familiar with the uh, uh, law of the convention. Uh, um, the part of the convention which I want to uh, deal with uh, in this uh, session is a dispute settlement. The Law of Sea Convention provides a comprehensive system uh, of settling any dispute concerning interpretation or application of the Convention. Uh, this system of uh, dispute settlement is provided for in Part 15 of the Convention. Uh, Part 15 of the Convention is a very comprehensive and innovative uh, uh, chapter, uh, part uh, of the convention. You may know that the uh, Law of the Sea Convention, uh, of course, is a comprehensive treaty covering uh, all aspects of the ocean. The uh, convention has uh, 320 articles and nine annexes. Uh, uh, you can easily guess. Uh, from time to time, dispute may arise concerning how the uh, provision of the Convention uh, is to be interpreted uh, and applied. Uh, in case of uh, such dispute, this uh, Part 15 of dispute settlement is applied. Uh, you may also know that the Law of the Convention is uh, uh, adopted uh, as a so-called package deal. Uh, the convention as a whole is a very complex uh, uh, um, um, is a result of very complex uh, uh, compromise. And in fact, a uh, very uh, uh, fine balance has been achieved through this compromise. And it is very important uh, to maintain this uh, balance. And Part 15 of the Convention plays an important role in, uh, in uh, maintaining this uh, delicate balance achieved uh, at the Third UN Conference on the uh, it, it, In fact, uh, former president of uh, Third UN Conference on the Law of Sea uh, said this Part 15 of the Convention on Dispute Settlement is a pivot upon which delicate equilibrium of the compromise uh, must be balanced. Uh, part 15 is composed of three sections. Section 1 on general uh, provision. Uh, section 2, in fact, uh, very, uh, very innovative uh, uh, section. Uh, section 2 is about the compulsory procedure. And section 3 uh, concerns 
some limitations and exceptions to the applicability of Section 2 of compulsory procedure. Just briefly, uh, general provision. If you look at the, this section, uh, there are several uh, uh, rules. Uh, starting with this uh, fundamental obligation to settle dispute by peaceful means. Uh, this peaceful settlement of dispute is, of course, uh, 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 very fundamental obligation of the states uh, enshrined in the United Nations Charter and many other uh, international agreements. Uh, this basic principle was uh, also uh, stipulated in uh, Article 279. Then, uh, if you look at the Article 280, uh, peaceful means of parties' own choice prevail over Part 15. In fact, uh, uh, parties can always agree on the uh, means of uh, their own choice. If parties can do that, uh, those means prevail over Part 15 of the Convention. However, when parties are unable to settle their dispute by means of their own choice, then uh, Part 15 uh, will be applied. That idea is provided for in Article 581. Uh, so Part uh, 15 uh, will be applied when uh, no settlement has been reached by the means of parties' own choice. There are some several uh, conditions for this provision to be applied. And I will skip this. Uh, and another important uh, uh, provision uh, in general uh, section is uh, this one. Prior obligation to submit the dispute to a procedure on the general, regional, or bilateral agreements or otherwise prevail over uh, part 15. Uh, if uh, state parties to the Lomsi Convention uh, have agreed to submit their dispute to a procedure uh, which entails uh, a binding decision through regional, general, regional, or bilateral agreements or otherwise. Otherwise, for example, by accepting so-called optional clause uh, under Article 38, Paragraph 2 of the ICJ Statute. Uh, then, such procedure will apply in lieu of Part 15. In other words, such procedure will prevail over Part 15. So this is another uh, exception uh, to application of Part 15 of the Convention. One more uh, obligation in general provision is obligation to exchange views regarding the settlement of dispute by negotiation or other peaceful means. When dispute arise between state parties to law state convention, uh, those uh, state parties must proceed to exchange of exchange view uh, regarding the settlement of this word by negotiation on other means of this procedure. Uh, this is a very important obligation uh, before this next section, se section, in other words, compulsory procedure. Uh, will be involved. Uh, I just returned from Hamburg uh, 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 just giving a judgment of preliminary objection uh, in a dispute between Italy and Panama. One of the issues we dealt with is uh, uh, whether uh, this obligation under Article 283, that is obligation to exchange will have been completed in this dispute. Uh, and uh, we, we, we found that uh, this 
obligation has been fulfilled in that particular case. So this uh, question often arises in uh, this period uh, before uh, a tribunal or other uh, uh, court or tribunal such as arbitral. So this is a general provisions. Uh, then uh, next uh, section two on compulsory procedure. Uh, when uh, parties, state parties to the convention are unable to uh, settle their dispute by recourse to section one, in other words, uh, uh, by recourse to this uh, uh, consensual, consensual procedure, then uh, this compulsory procedure applies at the request of uh, any party to the dispute. So any party to the dispute can unilaterally submit uh, its dispute to this compulsory procedure when no settlement has been reached by recourse to uh, these uh, general provisions which I just described, just, just uh, talked about. Then, uh, what kind of compulsory procedures are available? Uh, Article 287 uh, provides for so choice of procedures. Uh, under this article, uh, state parties to the obstacle convention uh, have four choices. Uh, they can choose one or more out of those four available uh, means. That is, they can submit uh, their dispute to the International Tribunal for the Law of Sea, International Court of Justice, arbitral tribunal established in accordance with Annex 7 of the Convention, and Annex 8, Special Arbitral Tribunal. Disputants' are given considerable freedom and flexibility in choosing procedures. Disputants uh, can choose one or more of those uh, procedures at any time. They can choose those procedures or they decide not to choose any procedure. They can choose this procedure with respect to any dispute concerning interpretation or application of the convention or particular kind of the convention. So disputants have considerable flexibility in choosing the procedure. If the parties have chosen the same procedure, then the dispute goes to that procedure. For example, there is a dispute between state A and state B, and state A chose, it lost. State B also chose, it lost, as means to settle this dispute. Then dispute goes to where? Dispute goes to the US. If not, dispute goes to NS7 arbitrary tribunal. In case of this dispute between state A and state B, state A chose it lost, state B chose ICJ, then dispute goes to neither it lost nor ICJ. It goes to where? Annex 7 arbitration. State party that has not selected any procedure is deemed to have chosen the annex seven arbitral tribunal. So here is a dispute between state A, state and B. State A chose it was and state B decide not to choose any procedure. Then state B is deemed to have chosen what? And a seven arbitral tribunal. Therefore dispute goes to where dispute goes to an 7 
So uh, the result is uh, NX7 arbitrary tribunal is a default for so called default for. If you look at uh, 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 this uh, current situation, right now there are 168 state parties out of those state parties. 33 states chose it was as a first choice or second choice. And 27 states chose ICJ. State which chose NX7 arbitration are nine. State which chose NX8 arbitration are eleven. So the largest number of states chose uh, it was. But still, out of 168, is uh, just uh, what uh, about one fifth? Remember, only those disputes that will be chosen by both parties to dispute are submitted to the ITOS or ICJ. Otherwise, all those disputes are submitted to an external arbitration. So as a consequence, many cases have been submitted to an external arbitration by operation of Article 287. As I recall, uh, there are more than 10 cases on the merits have been submitted to an external arbitration. Not because they chose not because parties to dispute have chosen an external arbitration, but because of this default uh, arrangement. Okay. Now, third and final section of part 15 is uh, exception. There are two exceptions. The first is a limitation on the applicability of compulsory procedure uh, provided for in Article 297. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at uh, 297, certain types of disputes are not subject to a compulsory procedure. Article 297 has uh, three paragraphs. But I must say that uh, this article, Article 297, is uh, one of the most difficult articles uh, in the entire law of convention. I, I don't think there is any uh, settled uh, view on the interpretation of this article. I don't have any view on this question. I don't know how this provision should be interpreted. But anyway, uh, if I just briefly uh, say, dispute concerning interpretation or application of convention may be going to exercise by both state of its sovereign rights or jurisdiction shall be subject to a conversion procedure in the three cases. Uh, and then, uh, if you look at uh, this uh, article, 197 paragraph 1, there are three uh, situations which is uh, subject to, which are subject to this uh, compulsory procedure, uh, such as uh, uh, violation of freedom of navigation uh, uh, by coastal state, or in exercising such freedom, you know, uh, uh, other states uh, uh, violates uh, Convention or laws and regulation of postal state, and also violation of postal uh, states of the, this provision on protection and preservation of marine life. So, with respect to those three situations, uh, 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 this compulsory procedure is applied. What does that mean? Then, in a situation other than those three cases, uh, compulsory procedure is not applicable. I don't know. Uh, 
this is a very difficult question. There are two different views on this question. I don't want to get into that. And then, uh, uh, if you look at the paragraph two, uh, say dispute concerning uh, interpretation or application of convention with respect to marine scientific research is also subject to compulsory jurisdiction. Except for this, a dispute concerning exercise of right or discretion by coastal state regarding marine scientific research. All decision to suspend the research project. They are not subject to uh, a compulsory procedure. And if you look at the paragraph uh, 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 three, uh, some paragraph three, the no, paragraph three, uh, uh, dispute uh, concerning uh, interpretation or application of convention with respect to fisheries uh, also subject to compulsory procedure, except for this. Hmm? Uh, dispute concerning postal uh, states so advice with respect to living resources in either or their exercise, uh, such as postal uh, states the determination of so-called uh, Total allowable catch, uh, coastal states, the determination of uh, uh, capacity to harvest, uh, and so on. So those are not subject to uh, compulsory position. The latter two types of dispute, uh, this, uh, uh, certain types of dis dispute uh, with respect to marine scientific re research or is a fishery, uh, uh, however, <coughs> are subject to so-called compulsory conciliation. Don't worry too much about this provision. <laughs> <laughs> you will be forgiven, huh? even if you don't understand this. <laughs> In fact, uh, not many people uh, understand this. Uh, Larry, you may remember that uh, used to say uh, Article 76 of the Convention is one of the most difficult provisions in the Convention, and uh, you will be forgiven if you don't understand uh, uh, Article 76 after reading uh, this provision 10 times, 20 times. The same may be applied to this one as well. This is another very, very difficult and controversial provision. Now, uh, anyway, uh, certain type of disputes are not subject to compulsory proceedings. This is the uh, uh, maybe the only thing we can safely remember, right? Uh, then there are second uh, exception, that is optional exceptions to applicability of compulsory procedure. This is not an easy task either, but uh, compared to Article 297, which we just uh, talked about, uh, is uh, probably uh, slightly less controversial. That doesn't mean this provision is easy to uh, understand. Uh, uh, Article 298 uh, uh, allows state parties to convention to exclude certain type of uh, uh, dispute from uh, compulsory uh, procedure. One of those types of uh, dispute, uh, three types of such dispute. First, the dispute concerning interpretation or application of articles 15, 74, and 83 uh, relating to sea boundary limitation. 15, concerns uh, delimitation of territorial sea, 74, uh, delimitation of uh, exclusive economic zone, 83, uh, delimitation of contemporary Or a dispute involving historic base and titles. So state party exclude those dispute from uh, compulsory procedure. Second, dispute concerning military activities, and uh, dispute concerning uh, uh, certain law enforcement activities. Not all law enforcement activity, but law enforcement activity uh, in regard to uh, uh, 
exercise of sovereign rights of jurisdiction uh, excluded from uh, this jurisdiction important tribunal which I just mentioned. Uh, it's a certain type of uh, uh, marine scientific research is built on a certain type of uh, ease and fishery research. Third uh, type of dispute uh, that can be excluded is a dispute in respect of the image. United Nations Security Council is exercising uh, the function assigned to it by the Charter. So those three types of dispute uh, can be excluded uh, if party Once, if party make declaration to exclude uh, them from the procedure. This is the uh, uh, list of uh, states which make uh, a declaration uh, with respect to one or more of those disputes uh, provided for the After uh, about 35 states which made uh, Declaration. For example, Korea made a declaration to exclude all three types of uh, dispute from this compulsory procedure. Now, uh, Let me move to International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Uh, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the tribunal, uh, was founded by the NS6 of the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, if you look at the Article 1 of the NS6, uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea is constituted and shall function in accordance with the provision of this convention of the state. The uh, tribunal was founded uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so uh, in last month, uh, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the founding of the convention. Uh, we had uh, this uh, symposium, today's symposium, and the commemoration ceremony uh, attended by German uh, President uh, and uh, Secretary General Andy Moon uh, of the United Nations and other uh, uh, people. Um, of course, the uh, tribunal was created by the Convention, but the relationship between uh, tribunal and Convention especially this uh, part 15 of the convention is uh, a bit more complicated than, than you might think. Uh, on the one hand, although Trigger was created as a standing court uh, by the convention, it is it doesn't have this uh, privilege of being the only exclusive court to deal with the dispute arising in the world. As I just talked about, it is one of the four means of dispute settlement under the convention. So we don't have this uh, privilege of uh, being an exclusive uh, court. Uh, in fact, uh, it is, tribunal is not even a default forum. Uh, default forum is what? NX7 arbitration. Arbitral tribunal is default forum. So tribunal is not even a default forum, uh, except for two urgent proceedings. Uh, that is, uh, court release proceeding under Article 292 and it's a special provisional measure proceeding on the article 5 and 9. 
On the other hand, once again, although tribunal was founded by law of the state convention, the jurisdiction of the tribunal is not confined to dispute concerning the interpretation or application of the convention. In fact, uh, uh, jurisdiction of the tribunal goes beyond uh, disputes arising under the convention. Uh, if you look at the Article 21 of the statute of the tribunal, uh, tribunal <coughs> jurisdiction is uh, rather uh, broad. Take a look at the jurisdiction of tribunal. Article 21 of the statute, very important uh, provision. It states that the jurisdiction of tribunal comprises all disputes and all applications submitted to it in accordance with uh, this convention. So obviously, the jurisdiction of tribunal comprises uh, dispute concerning interpretation or application of the convention. And then next part is very important. All matters uh, provided for in any other agreement which confers jurisdiction to the tribunal. All matters provided for any other agreement which confers jurisdiction to the tribunal. So, tribunal can deal with the uh, dispute arising under other agreement, any other agreement, as long as that agreement confers jurisdiction to the tribunal. In fact, uh, this Second part of the Article 21 was subject to uh, scrutiny in the latest advisory proceeding uh, last year. Uh, it was very controversial, but uh, this part, the second part, was uh, interpreted by a tribunal uh, to give a broad uh, competence and jurisdiction to the tribunal, including uh, its advisory jurisdiction. Um, one more thing you should know about the jurisdiction of tribunal is uh, jurisdiction of in, uh, CBET Disputes Chamber. CBET Dispute Chamber is a kind of uh, uh, court within the court. Uh, it is a chamber of the tribunal. Uh, it is composed of 11 judges out of 21 judges of the tribunal. Uh, but Tibet Dispute Chamber has uh, autonomous uh, status uh, within the tribunal. Uh, so, um, uh, con convention uh, uh, provides for, specifically provides for the jurisdiction of Tibet Dispute Chamber in Article 187. Uh, if you look at 187, see that dispute chamber shall have jurisdiction in disputes with respect to activities in the area uh, falling within the following categories. So, see that dispute chamber has jurisdiction with respect to this uh, dispute uh, uh, arising uh, in the area. In other words, see that and subsoil beyond national jurisdiction. And there are six types of, uh, uh, six categories of dispute, if you look at the Article 187. One thing you should remember uh, with respect to this uh, jurisdiction of civil dispute chamber is, civil uh, dispute chamber is not subject to this Choice of procedure rule under Article 287. What does that mean? That means chamber is entrusted with exclusive function, exclusive function of uh, Part 50, uh, Part 11 of the Convention and relevant annexes. So whenever dispute arises with respect to activities in the area. That dispute must be subject to 
see that this will change. It is not subject to this uh, choice of procedural provision. So parties, parties to dispute with respect to activities in the civil area cannot choose procedure out of those four available procedures under Article 287. Right? They cannot choose it laws, ICJ, arbitral tribunal, and so on. Dispute concerning this activity in the civil area must be submitted to uh, a civil dispute chamber. So I believe that uh, civil dispute chamber, uh, when uh, this civil mining uh, becomes uh, active, will be very important uh, body to settle all those disputes uh, arising in the international civil area. Because it has exclusive jurisdiction. So far, civil dispute chamber has dealt with only one case. Uh, this, uh, they gave advisory opinion uh, with respect to this uh, responsibility, obligation, and liability of sponsoring state. So far, it has not dealt with any dispute because uh, still, you know, civil dispute, uh, civil mining uh, has not is not very active yet. Uh, but in the future, this uh, chamber is going to be very important uh, uh, body in terms of this new settlement. Of course, uh, 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 tribunal uh, has uh, is an important function to settle this bill, but tribunal can also give advisory opinion. Uh, in, in fact, uh, this uh, advisory uh, jurisdiction of the tribunal is not specifically provided for in the convention, but as I mentioned uh, last year, uh, we interpreted Article 21 of the statute rather broadly so that the tribunal can give such opinion when a request is made. Uh, on the other hand, the CBET dispute chamber has uh, advisory jurisdiction, and this is a specific provided for in Article 191 of the Convention. Now, uh, just briefly, uh, uh, tribunal is open to uh, state party to the convention by right now 167 states and European Union. Tribunal is also open to entities other than state party in any case of meeting pursuant to any other agreement conforming jurisdiction on the tribunal. So uh, tribunal uh, may be open to entity other than state party. Uh, but then, what's the meaning of entities other than state party? Maybe non-state party uh, can be in such entity. Uh, but what about uh, this, uh, 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 say, uh, entity such as uh, uh, natural person or juridical person? or international organizations, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, again, I don't have set in view on this question. Uh, and I know this, uh, we're going to look at it. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, CBET dispute chamber is uh, open to entity other state parties. In any case, expressly provided for in Party 11. And in fact, Party 11 specifically uh, provides that uh, not only states, but also international civil authority, enterprise, natural and juridical person can appear before civil dispute chamber. Of course, uh, this is a, a 
very substantive development uh, compared to international court of justice. Uh, in, in, in international court of justice, only state uh, can be uh, part of it. Only state can appear before international court of justice. But uh, in case of ITLOS, uh, in some uh, limited cases, entities other than state parties can appear. Now, uh, remember, uh, ITLOS is a default form for two origin proceedings. Uh, and uh, briefly, First uh, uh, case is the response to this proceeding when uh, postal state authority uh, detains uh, vessels of another state and it is alleged that uh, the Italian state has not complied with the uh, original convention for court rulings, then flag state of detained vessel can uh, this prompt release application can apply prompt release of vessel and crew uh, either to uh, any court of tribunal agreed upon by the parties uh, within 10 days from the time of detention. But that is impossible in reality. Party cannot, uh, this, uh, uh, disputants cannot agree upon court to tribunal within 10 days from the detention. Or to international tribunal laws. So, in reality, uh, disputants are unable to agree upon court of tribunal within 10 days of the detention. This court release application is always submitted to uh, international tribunal laws. So far, we have dealt with uh, nine uh, court release applications. So point to release is a very important function of uh, tribunal. Another uh, uh, situation in which it was is a default form is uh, this one. Uh, this provisional measure, prescription of provisional measure under Article 290, Paragraph 5. When dispute is submitted to Annex 7 arbitral tribunal, Usually it takes substantive time. It takes you know, at least uh, several months, uh, usually five, six months, before the composition of arbitral tribunal. Then, uh, pending the composition of arbitral tribunal, uh, one of parties to dispute may submit a request for provisional measure. If you know the, what is provisional measure, provisional measure is a kind of original measure uh, to preserve respective rights for parties to dispute or to uh, prevent serious harm to marine environment. Uh, then, uh, since uh, this arbitral tribunal is not, has not yet been constituted, such request for provisional measure may be submitted to international tribunal for the purpose. So that is Article 290, Paragraph 5, uh, provisional measure. Uh, again, uh, uh, so far, uh, there have been seven requests for such provisional measure to our tribunal. And again, this uh, provisional measure is a very important function of uh, this measure. So out of 25 cases submitted to it, so 16 cases were either punctuous or provisional measure uh, under Article 29. Now, uh, here is the list of cases Tribunal has been has dealt with and is dealing with uh, at the moment uh, over past two decades. A number of cases submitted before trial 
in the past 30 years is 25. So slightly more than one case uh, per year. It's not many, I know. Huh? Current state, uh, 21 cases have been already decided. Uh, two cases is continuing, two cases uh, currently pending. Types of dispute we have been dealing with nine companies, seven provisional measures, seven cases on the merits, and two advisory people. Subject matter of dispute include yes, a release, a provisional measure. Rice enforcement action of also said in the EAZ uh, in terms of maritime zones uh, the most disputes submitted to the tribunal are really uh, dispute that is taking place in in, in exclusive economies. Maritime boundary limitation responsibility and liability of states with respect to activities in the area, law enforcement and due process, IUU <coughs> fishing, arrest and detention of vessels, etc. Parties to dispute in terms of regional attribute uh, distribution Parties that appear before the tribunal include 11 Asian states, 7 Africa, 11 Latin America and Caribbean, 13 Western Europe, 4 Eastern Europe. In terms of economic development our state, 22 developed states, 24 developed states. Major jurisprudence of tribunal. In fact, Tribunal has a substantive contribution uh, to this uh, prompt release of vessel and crew. As I said, we have dealt with uh, nine such cases uh, and also provisional measure, especially under Article 290, Paragraph 5. Maritime boundary limitation. Uh, tribunal uh, was the first court or tribunal to delimit the continental shelf beyond continental miles. And also rise and enforcement action of postal state of EEZ. Uh, you may know that uh, EEZ is a very delicate zone and also zone of tension. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, tension between postal state maritime state uh, with respect to uh, activities in the EEZ. Uh, the tribunal has uh, clarified a certain important uh, aspect of uh, exclusive economy especially such as uh, whether uh, bunkering is uh, uh, allowed. Uh, bunkering is, uh, uh, can be regulated. Bunkering in the exclusive economy zone can be regulated in the coastal state. And so on. Also, tribunal uh, clarified uh, 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 obligation and liability of sponsors with respect to the activities in the area. Uh, see that beyond the national jurisdiction. Uh, are you fishing? Is that tribunal gave a major uh, advisory opinion with respect to? Illegal, unregulated, unreported, and unregulated fishing and exclusive products. Those are uh, uh, major contributions uh, in terms of uh, uh, juice. Finally, uh, let me make a quick assessment of the uh, uh, contribution of tribunal in the last decades. Uh, 
uh, is out of four available means under Article 287. Tribunal has received more cases than any other procedure. Uh, Tribunal has received more cases than ICJ. NX7 arbitral tribunal. However, I must say a large majority of cases, especially on the merits, have been uh, submitted to NX7 arbitration. Well, this is unfortunate, at least from our standpoint. Uh, we wish uh, that uh, those cases submitted to tribunal, but uh, uh, <coughs> that was the uh, uh, choice of uh, uh, parties to stay parties to the civil solution. There's nothing uh, much we can do about this. The pace of building is located so far is comparable to that of other municipalities in the early years. Uh, Twenty-five cases uh, for twenty years, uh, but uh, if you look at uh, say uh, um, uh, past several years, uh, past uh, say five or six years, uh, uh, obviously uh, case of building docket has uh, uh, quite increased uh, over the past uh, five or six years. Uh, so obviously we are picking up. Huh? Cases have been submitted even in terms of region and the status of development. As activities in the area progresses, more disputes are likely to be submitted to the civil dispute chamber with its exclusive compulsory jurisdiction. Now, International Civil Authority uh, is discussing this uh, 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 this exploitation regulation and uh, it is expected that the uh, exploitation uh, of uh, cement mineral is likely to take place in in five years or uh, in the near future then uh, I believe that uh, more disputes are likely to be submitted to civil dispute. Tribunal has played a special role as a default form in developing case laws and policies and judicial measures. As I said, the uh, majority of cases submitted to tribunal are either policies uh, or judicial measures. You should not underestimate the uh, importance of those cases. In fact, uh, one of the reasons uh, for creating a new standing uh, international court uh, during the third UN conference of the World Sea was uh, that uh, uh, this need to respond quickly to the arrest or detention of uh, vessels. Uh, it is very important to maritime studies. Uh, when fishing vessel was arrested, is arrested uh, for allegedly illegal fishing and detained. Fishing vessel, of course, uh, suffers uh, huge uh, cost huh? uh, because it is not able to uh, engage with fishing. Uh, so this uh, institutional plan release was 
introduced to protect the interest of maritime uh, space. And uh, what is important is a very quick response to uh, an application of four point two years. And in fact, when application of a photon rays is submitted to our tribunal, uh, we usually give a decision within one month from the date of application. Within one month, hmm? when application is made, uh, together and have a hearing and the deliberation, and give this to me all within one month. Tribunal of 21 judges giving a decision within one month. And in fact, uh, all, all nine cases of pro-police application, Tribunal was able to give this decision within one month. So it was uh, uh, highly effective. And in fact, uh, we have been doing what was uh, uh, originally intended. And also, is the prescription of provisional measure should not be underestimated either. Of course, provisional measure is a really provisional, interim provisional measure. It is not intended to resolve the dispute conclusively. It is just a provisional relief pending the final decision of the tribunal or arbitral tribunal. But in reality, prescription of provisional measure often leads to the resolution of this bit, conclusive resolution of this bit. This is what happened in several cases. When um, Argentine worship our libertad was detained by authority of Ghana in Ghanaian port of Tampa. There was very serious, serious dispute between Argentina and Ghana broke out. And the provisional measure request was submitted to the tribunal. And again, when such request is uh, made, we give a decision, we give an order within one month. We gave a provisional measure order to release this vessel and the vessel was released. Of course, it was only provisional measure. But when vessel was released and allowed to return to uh, Buenos Aires, uh, Ghana and Argentina sat together and discussed whether they will continue this uh, proceeding, and they decide to terminate the proceeding. And this provisional measure actually resolved this very serious dispute between the countries. So, provisional measure is not provisional measure. In fact, it was an ultimate measure leading to Resolution. Uh, tribunal has also clarified the rights of coastal states and freedom of other states in the EZ, thus safeguarding the balance between them. Another important contribution tribunal has made in terms of uh, jurisprudence on the American boundary limitation was. Uh, Bay of Bengal case, Tribunal has followed the well established jurisprudence in maritime boundary litigation while it has played a pioneering role in the delimitation of contemporary shock beyond 281. All in all, uh, while the number of cases Tribunal has dealt with so far is relatively limited, I believe that the tribunal has made a solid contribution to the rule of law by settling disputes and also by clarifying 
international law in Mali in convention and further developing international law Any any questions? Please. Uh, I this is already uh, quarter past one, but uh, maybe I have five minutes for a question. And uh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, when you're clarifying and developing the national law, what kind of elements do you take into consideration? Um, Well, you know, um, we don't try to develop international law, but uh, sometimes the uh, uh, um, rule is not uh, um, uh, entirely clear, uh, or rule is uh, rather general, or elementary. Uh, so in order to settle the dispute uh, before us, uh, it was uh, Sometimes it was inevitable for the tribunal to, to go a little bit beyond uh, simply clarify uh, the rule. Uh, but of course, it is always not entirely clear to, uh, it is always a bit difficult to draw a clear line between you know, uh, clarification and the development of. Well, I think this is part of uh, this uh, judicial work of this uh, Which one is clarification, which one is development? It's up to the commentator. Any other? Yes? <laughs> Pat? Okay. Um, I guess I have a question about the advisory opinion process. You, in the case that you had before the tribunal, you had a small group of states create largely for the purposes, almost for the purposes of creating the question, to go to the tribunal to answer a question that involved not their treaty, really, but the law of the sea convention. And I'm just wondering, how far does that go? Can Australia and Canada now get an agreement Unlikely. Unlikely. We get an agreement to create an advisory opinion on a provision of the convention that may not even affect us, but that we want to have a clarification or uh, a pronouncement. And I'm, I've been a little bit concerned about the way that the tribunal um, took that jurisdiction in that particular case and, and, and starting to see not just my very fictitious situation, but starting to hear states um, thinking about this possibility of almost an, uh, using the tribunal in that kind of way. And you will know, of course, better than I, that the advisory opinions under the International Court of Justice do not come from individual states. They come from bodies set up by the United Nations. So, they, so it, it's, it's a very different process that IMLOS has opened itself up to. And I wonder if you just have any comment on that at all, other than to say that you have no comment. <laughs> well, the uh, advisory opinion uh, tribunal gave last year uh, was uh, a response to a request made by S SFR. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sub, sub regional fishery, sub regional fishery commission, right? Yeah. Uh, SRFC, right? Uh, SRFC, sub regional fishery commission, composed of uh, five, six uh, Western African uh, countries. Uh, so it was a request uh, submitted by international organization, regional organization, and uh, 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 then, uh, of course. Uh, you may raise this question whether a tribunal would give advisory opinion uh, even when uh, two states uh, 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 completed an agreement uh, whereby they uh, uh, submit a request for advisory opinion. I, I don't know. Um, uh, I can't answer really. Uh, uh, when time comes, uh, we are going to uh, uh, see. 
But uh, if you if you read the uh, advisory opinion uh, tribunal gave last year, uh, it was uh, very carefully uh, drafted. Uh, I hope you read uh, some uh, some this uh, portion and prudence on the part of the tribunal uh, uh, in giving uh, this uh, opinion. And uh, we, I believe the tribunal has been rather so respect, uh, we respect the ethical law and the scope of jurisdiction uh, and, and so on. Uh, but uh, um, um, I, I don't know, really, I can't answer the question. It's a good question, but it has no answer. <laughs> <laughs> I have no sense of view. Maybe other. My other colleagues may have some view on this, but I have no sense of view. When time comes, I will uh, listen to the different views. Uh, yes, thank, thank you very much. That was, that was, that was a wonderful, uh, thorough run through of the role and achievements of the tribunal. My question, you were right to highlight, I think, that the pioneering role the tribunal has had in delimitation, particularly in the Bay of Bengal case, for the limitation beyond the 200 mile limit. The, in that delimitation, the tribunal was also pioneering in a, in, a, in a fashion in that through the adjustment of the line away from equidistance to relieve from the cutoff effect of the concavity of the Bangladeshi coastline, that inevitably created the gray area beyond the 200 mile limit from Bangladesh, but was within 200 miles of Myanmar. And that, to a certain extent, has created a new challenge for those two states in terms of Myanmar's water column jurisdiction overlying Bangladesh's extended continental shelf rights. Do you have any advice for <laughs> the states in dealing with that tricky problem, particularly as it's been compounded, if you will, by the Annex 7 Tribunal decision between India and Bangladesh, where creation of a, new, uh, uh, a further gray area which overlapped with that initial gray area. Do you have any, have any gray thoughts? Well, uh, um, if you, again, if you read uh, this, uh, decision judgment of the tribunal in the Bay of Bengal case, I'm sure you, you, you know very well. Um, tribunal uh, uh, laid uh, some emphasis on the, this uh, need for cooperation between uh, uh, two states. Um, obviously, this is a situation uh, uh, which really requires close cooperation between the states. And also, state must exercise due regard to interest and advice of other states. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, this problem is a really uh, insurmountable problem. Of course, it's not an easy problem. Uh, but uh, uh, in the past, uh, your country, Australia, has been cooperating with Indonesia to deal with such situation. Uh, so. Um, as we also emphasized, uh, we, we always had this problem. You know, uh, uh, seabed and subsoil is continental shelf, uh, and super adjacent water is a high sea. A different regime applies uh, to the water and the seabed and subsoil. So uh, this is not an entirely new situation. And the challenge uh, facing uh, states concerned uh, is, uh, is uh, it's not small, I would say, but it's not insurmountable either. So, uh, with cooperation, with the exercise of due regard, uh, I think they can, I hope uh, they will be able to find a uh, great intervention. Thank you. Over? Yeah. <laughs> great uh, presentation. You know, we learned so much from this academy. I suppose it's kind of a theoretical question, and the first point from the students here, you know, perhaps it's a question of 
right strategies. If you had to renegotiate convention, if you had to renegotiate the dispute settlement of provisions, is, is there any varying lacuna or is there any varying gap or is there anything you would adjust in, in light of the experience of uh, the functioning? You know, because these provisions are very novel in international law, and now we're into the difficult era of implementing these provisions and uh, addressing the dispute settlement in practice. So the benefit of hindsight uh, is ranking we could have improved upon. <laughs> One thing I can point out is that Pioneer should have been the default form. <laughs> well, uh, um, I don't know, but seriously, I, 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 I think, uh, uh, um, I don't know, uh, parties, uh, state parties to convention, uh, Prefer the arbit arbitration and seven arbitration and the full forum. Uh, maybe they believe that they can retain some control, influence over the process and outcome of the dispute uh, uh, through arbitration. Uh, but the uh, tribunal has a you know, special uh, chamber composed of five. Uh, Member, five judges, uh, out of five, uh, uh, two can be adult judge appointed by uh, uh, parties to dispute, but out of, uh, outside of uh, tribunal. Uh, so uh, it's really halfway between you know, this uh, tribunal and arbitration. And also, if you look at the composition of Annex 7 arbitral tribunal, in many cases, uh, usually uh, out of five, uh, two or three uh, arbitrators are uh, uh, judges of equals. Uh, South China Sea arbitration, uh, three out of five are incumbent judges of equals, and one was former judges of equals. Uh, so, um, I think, uh, I hope, uh, I don't know what should be uh, improved, uh, but uh, I hope uh, parties to this pursuit uh, look into what is available uh, in Part 15 and uh, try to take advantage of uh, what is offered there. Uh, uh, so, that's all I can say. <laughs> Any other? Yes, uh, Dr. Chair. Yeah, I have one brief question. In the, uh, in my opinion, the, uh, it's a kind of comment. In my opinion, two overlapping gray area. Uh, the solution can be a, a third party intervention procedure. Can be a, uh, can be an answer to this kind of problem. So I think that in the Indiana and uh, and uh, Bangladesh case, in my opinion, the arbitral can invite third party, I mean, in this case, uh, Myanmar as a party utilizing the third party intervention. So, so in this kind of situation, we can solve one time in one process, one legal process, solve that this kind of tricky question, I think so. And uh, yes, yeah. Can you cannot invite uh, or cannot ask uh, the third party to join yeah. this yeah. proceeding? It's up to third party. Third party has choice of intervention uh, as of right or discretion of intervention. Uh, but uh, really, it's up to the third states. There's nothing tribunal can do if uh, uh, third states uh, does not ask for intervention. But obviously, you know, it will be ideal that uh, if uh, these states with interest uh, to intervene. And Yes. You're the last. In case of training passes, I'm sorry, what was your question? Thank you.
Thank you very much.